uh, Psalm 108. I'll read there today. And a little thought's been on my heart for a while now, several days, and I'll, I'll give it to you this morning. While we're turning there, please uh, make sure you make all of our visitors welcome this morning. Uh, this um, have several first-time visitors. One bus brought the lady back there in the very back. Y'all be sure and speak to her. She don't speak good English, but she'll be glad to welcome you. About 10 of them this morning. That family came today. And then, uh, and y'all know Miss Rachel and uh, Opal here are, are now here. They have officially moved here. And so she needs a good paying job. And they're going to be praying about places. So raise your hand, Miss Rachel, so everybody knows who you are. Y'all help her out. Y'all help her out. Single parent with a special need child. Uh, uh, and so she needs help. <laughs> uh, uh, y'all pray for her uh, and help her out. Y'all, have, you know, it'd be, if I went to a church somewhere all by myself and I didn't know nobody, it sure, and people just walk by you like you're not even there. I mean, you need to think about that. Uh, I'm not preaching on that this morning, but uh, you always make sure you welcome new folks in when they come in like that. Thank the Lord. Let's look at Psalm 108 this morning. I, the conviction has failed. We got one hitting the altar already, and that's okay. All right. Uh, amen. Start them repenting early. They need it. Psalm 108. This little phrase is in the Bible about three times, I think. It might be the word four, maybe, but at least three times, and it grabbed my heart. And I'd like for you to look at it this morning. Stay with me for just a quick, short few minutes. Psalm 108, verse 1. Oh, God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise, even with my glory. Four little words there. David said, my heart is fixed. David had been through many battles. He was just... A young man, when he fought and killed the giant, he'd seen bloodshed. He'd seen thousands of people killed in battle all around him. He'd seen defeats. He had seen victories. He had come a long way by this time. And here, a psalm of David, the man of God, he said, God, my heart is fixed. After all I've been through, after everything I've seen, after all the people I've seen murdered, after seeing that giant go down, after seeing my own personal battles and failures, through it all, I'm not looking for something else to join, not looking for something else to believe in. My heart is fixed. I want to preach on that this morning. My heart is fixed. Now, what does that mean this morning? Your mind and your heart are so closely connected in the Bible that many Bible teachers teach them one and the same. They're not always. Uh, most of the time, your mind or your brain would be just a totaling of facts, like two plus two is four, eight plus eight is 16, like that. The, your heart is you, the real you, the seat of your emotions, as one man put it. So there's a little difference between the heart and the mind. But the closest thing, me and you, what could get to this little phrase here is that when David said, my heart is fixed, said, what does that mean? Does that mean there's something wrong with it and he took it to repair a shot? No, no. Does that mean health-wise? No. Now, you know what that means. If you read the Bible, you say, my heart is fixed. You know what that means. Me and you would, declare, would say it like this. I've got it settled. My mind is made up. Now, he said, I've got my mind made up about some things. And he said, I'm not going to change my mind on them. There ain't no use talking to me. There ain't no use trying to change me. He said, my heart is fixed. I'd like for us to be that way. You say, well, don't get so hard-headed. Nobody can't tell you nothing, preacher. Listen, if you ever get a hold of what's right, you don't have to worry about changing now, if you don't know it's right, then leave a little room for, for, for another opinion. But David said, my heart is fixed. Now, I want to say a few things about it this morning. And I want to say, first of all, my heart is fixed about God himself. I believe and know there is a God. There's got to be a God. Now, you kids that don't read the Bible and watch movies all the time, little by little, atheism thoughts will begin to creep into your brain because you're getting dirty input. 
And if you listen to the world, you listen to them cuss, you'll cuss. You let them drink, you'll drink. Whatever you watch on movies, eventually you're going to want to imitate. Eventually. And, uh, but if you see movies where there's no God and God's made fun of, first thing you know, you'll start thinking, well, maybe there ain't one. Uh, uh, there's these comedians nowadays. And one of the worst damage is being done, I believe, to, to people that believe the Bible are comedians. And these comedians go around the country mocking God and laughing at people who believe in God. There's a man by the name of Bill Maher. He has a show on HBO. Used to, I don't know, I don't have HBO. Don't want it, don't try to give it to me. You don't need it either. There's enough bad stuff on regular TV. And uh, uh, that's hell box office. But anyway, he puts that stuff on there and he spews forth venom and filth against the Bible. And he come on, I've got it on video, you've seen me show it, where he says, oh, the dumbest part of the Bible is where Jesus was born of a virgin. And he said, that's the silliest part. And all his audience, his little clones, his little cult following out in Hollywood laugh like crazy. Now, I've noticed something about Americans. Americans are very thin-skinned. And Americans cannot stand for somebody to laugh at them and ridicule them. As a matter of fact, most Christian young people, if they get ridiculed at school, they'll hide their Bible, they'll put up their tracks, they can't stand the thoughts of somebody laughing at them. But I'm going to tell you right now, if you're going to stand for God, you might as well get used to it. If somebody ain't ridiculing you, you're not even living right. Somebody wrote about me the other day, they ought to cut my tongue out. And they said the reason I ought to cut my tongue out because I preached a sermon on hell. You think I'll let that bother me? No, it did not. Con consider the source, buddy. Uh, somebody don't even believe in hell, don't believe the Bible, their opinion means nothing. I'm telling you this morning, Americans are scared to death of ridicule. And this guy stood up and he laughed and he said, there ain't no, there ain't no God. And here's what he said. He said, anybody who can believe in a book that talks about sticks turning into snakes, <laughs> they laughed, they laughed. You know the story when Moses throwed his rod down and it became a serpent, you know, and all of that. They laughed at us for that. And some of the Christians said, oh my goodness, do I believe that? I've been to church all my life. I didn't know I was so dumb. I didn't, I didn't. And they said, oh, they believe in sticks turning into snakes. <laughs> How stupid, how unsigned. Listen, if I, if I was in that meeting that day, I wish I would have been. And they'd say, you claim to be a preacher, don't you? You don't say something? I'd stand up and say, yes, I do. Uh, you think that's stupid? You people believe the whole universe got here by nothing by itself. That's about the dumbest thing I ever heard in my life. You know why you believe that? Some book you read that a man wrote. Give them their own medicine, brother. It makes a lot more sense to believe there is a God than to believe there's not a God. They believe that they're your human brain and the whole world got here by accident with no cause at all. At least we do believe there was a stick. Ours come from something. And God made the stick. Lord have mercy. I was looking at them mountains the other day going up through Tennessee as you cross over in the Tennessee border. Man, these rocks over there 10 times bigger than this church. You know how much them things weigh? Lord, there ain't no telling. I looked it up. I don't know how you can prove this, but I thought I wonder how much the world would weigh if you could weigh the world. Now you can't because of, of gravity pulls it all in. But if you could weigh the world, if you could take the world and put it on a scale, they figured it up. I don't know if they're right or not. Sometimes they are, sometimes they ain't. And the weight of the world is 170 with 21 zeros after it. That, in a little bit easier to understand, would be 1,000 trillion metric tons. I don't know how they figure that. They figure it by mass and area and water, land, rock. All the people in the world weigh 632 billion pounds. If you had all the people in the world, 632 billion, and they say the, some people weigh more, and it makes up for another 400 million, all the people that weigh more, that's right, uh, and all the little skinny ones, it averages out. Uh, uh, so uh, they say 600 billion pounds of people are on this earth. Now, if you see me do this right here this morning, if I take this pack of tracks and I hold it like that and drop it, it goes straight down. 
Now let's try this scientific experiment again. Ooh, two out of two. Let's try this scientific experiment again. Three out of three. Unless the wind's blowing real hard or something gets it, it's going straight down toward the middle of the earth. Watch me try to leave earth. I'm going to the moon. No, I ain't. Something's pulling me back down. You know what that is? Gravity. Who can explain gravity? There just so happens if the earth weighs six trillion metric tons, why is it just hanging out here in the middle of space? There's exactly enough gravity from the sun pulling on it to hold it right where it's at. Taking away the gravity of the moons, the other planets that are pulling a little bit here and there, and it holds it right in place. If there's a little less gravity, we'd go way out here and freeze to death. If there's a little more gravity, we'd go in closer and burn up. Just by pure accident, there's enough gravity. The world, three, uh, whatever I said a minute ago, six trillion three, uh, uh, metric tons is hanging on nothing, people. What's holding it up? You say gravity. And you really believe that? You really believe it just happened to be that much gravity? Exactly. They're going to make fun of us for believing the Bible. It's a lot more sensible and scientific to believe somebody made that. It's unscientific that belief order comes out of chaos by itself with no cause. That's not a scientific theory. I'm telling you this morning, I, my heart is fixed. There is a God. Don't you doubt it, brother. He's God. He's running this universe. He's looking at us right now. He knows the hairs on your head, brother, and he's got this thing under control. Uh, sight, smell, taste, touch, and Feel our five senses. All that evolved when I go running. I go running down Hoppy Tom every morning or Monday through Friday. I run. On, I usually run on Saturday and Sunday. And I'm going down the road like this. And when I'm running, I'm looking out there. I'm thinking about something I'm going to preach on or something like that. And I hear something go. I don't say there's a train approaching. I can tell that's a dog. And if, if a big truck comes, I'm going to, big truck coming. Don't even have to look. That evolved. Hearing evolved. And sound evolved so you could hear something. <laughs> Come on now. I mean, you mean to tell me it was just an accident? Sound evolved. There wasn't no sound. Then there was some. And there wasn't no ears, then there was your ears, you got two of them, they just happened to be on each side of your head. What if your ear was right here? If evolution is true. You know, say, hey, them, brother Daniel, say, what'd you say, Jimmy? <laughs> I, I mean, think about that. They just happened to be. Your nose is right here, right there, so you can smell. I can close my eyes and open that door and say, I, there's a fire. There's a skunk, it's the boy's dorm at camp, or a skunk, or something died in there, or it smells like donuts, or chocolate. You can tell without even looking. When my eyes close, I can tell food smells. Fire, if a lady walks by, perfume, nice perfume. I, if, if, if we can tell the difference, I don't understand why people think music can't be bad. If smells can be bad, and touch can be bad, and hear can be bad, sounds can be bad. All that evolved, all that evolved by itself, we just so happen to be able to see. Your eyes can do what no camera in the world can do. Jimmy, focus. Mike, focus. Guitar, focus. Floor, focus. Ceiling, focus. And you don't, and both of them look at the same thing exactly together. That's an accident. I'm telling you, my heart is fixed. There's a God. You say, well, there's millions of people, but somebody said this one time, it made a lot of sense. If 10 million people say a dumb thing, it is 
is still a dumb thing. And that's what evolution is. It is a dumb thing. When a man said there's no God, he is showing he's a fool. You mean to tell me jealousy evolved from nothing? Pride, anger, hunger. My heart is fixed, brother. There's time, space, and matter evolved. Where did time come from? If, if there was nothing, there wasn't even no time. If there ain't no time, there ain't no when to put it. If there ain't no space, there ain't no what to put. And if there ain't no matter, matter there ain't no what. And if there ain't no space, there ain't no when or no where to put it. You understand that? That means God made time, space, and matter. Everything's time, space, or matter. Space is just, but space, matter is stuff you can touch, and time, it's ticking. Before that, there wasn't no yesterday or tomorrow. When we get to heaven, there won't be no yesterday or tomorrow. It'll be just always now. Listen, a scientist can't figure that out. When you reject God's word, you accept the devil's stuff, and the God of this world blinds your mind that you cannot see it. I'm telling you, hallelujah, let the world life, let them make fun my heart is fixed there's a God I'm going to say hurriedly this morning my heart is fixed about this book here this Bible, my heart's fixed settled it has been examined if there's something wrong with the Bible they'd have found it by now buddy, this book has been scrutinized, it has been examined, picked that picked apart. They've done everything in this world to find something wrong with this Bible and they ain't found one yet. If anybody hears me preach on the, on, on the internet and they hear me then, uh, we'd like for you to show us one mistake in the Bible. You say, well, I know where a mistake is. No, mistake's in your brain. It ain't in that book. Somebody a lot smarter than you would have found it by now, like Robert Dick Wilson, who could speak, read, and write like 20-something different languages, like the scholars that have lived and died before me and you ever got here when there wasn't no TV or nothing, and they spent thousands and thousands of hours. I, they, they've traced it down. They found every one of those places mentioned in the Bible, Sodom and Gomorrah. They found those tools in the Bible. They found those money shekels and, and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the might and all those money uh, currency in the Bible. They found them in multitudes over there in the old land. History bears it out. The word of God stands, brother, like a solid rock. I'm glad, thank God, my heart is fixed upon this Bible. You know why I believe the Bible? I believe the Bible, number one, because of what it's done in my life and other people's lives. There ain't never been a book made a change in people like that book can make. I tell you, some man running to that book right there, I've seen drug dealers lay down their drugs and never touch it again. I've seen alcoholics put the bottle down and turn the other way. Rehab can't do that. AA can't do that. This book will change you. I believe it's true because the change is made in my life. I believe it's true because it's ability to predict the future. It can predict the future and never miss it one time. 40 authors, 1,600 years. Most of these men never even met each other that wrote the Bible, and yet it all comes together as one solid unit. I'm telling you, thank God, the Bible is true. The Bible made two big predictions for the last days. He said before the Lord comes back, there's two great things gonna happen. Number one, time will be like it was in the days of Noah. Number two, the days of Lot. We are living to see those prophecies being fulfilled right now. You know what the days of Noah were? Here's what the days of Noah were, eating, Drinking, living it up. All they think about is food, food, food. And the only time they're not thinking about food is trying to figure out some way to get rid of them all that calories that they just got through eating and get hungry and eat again. Uh, food, marrying and giving in marriage, no regard for the marriage altar, no regard for the marriage vows. And he said the thoughts of men's heart was only evil continually. That's the way you know you're in the last days. Nailed it, buddy, nailed it. And he said in the days of Lot, that's Sodom and Gomorrah. That's the homosexual agenda. You listen, people 100 years ago would not have believed we're seeing what we're seeing today. 
I ain't got time to get into all of that, but God made male and female. Jesus said you were born male and female, and just in case there's somebody in here, your head's all messed up, and the devil's caused you to believe a lie, let me just inject this right quick into the message. If you were born a girl, if God lets you be born as a girl, you are a girl. You will always be a girl. You can take medicine. You can have surgery. You can try. You can grow a beard. You can get muscles. But you will always be a girl. And no matter what you do, you will stand before God as a girl. You hear me? If you're a boy, same thing. You, I don't know what medicine you take to... Make you act like that. Some of them are born acting like that. But I'm telling you, they're still a boy. Amen? One guy said, well, I was born gay. No, you were not born gay. Are you listening? There is not, everybody hear me, there is not one scientific bit of proof in this world that teaches people are born gay. A guy grows up and he, he wants to kill people. Was he born a murderer? No, it's a choice. You might inherit certain traits where you'd be one way or the other, maybe pride, have a temper. You might get from your parents. But sin is a choice. It's a choice. I fixed on the Word of God. I'm fixed on church. I believe in it. Y'all know me. I believe you ought to go to church, brother, when you feel bad. I believe you ought to go to church when you're late and tired and sleepy and wore out. I believe you ought to go to church every time the doors are open. I believe you ought to go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night. We meet three times a week. That ain't enough, evidently, for most people. I don't know how you think. I'll just get in one little lick here, and that'll do me till next week. I, don't, I heard one guy the other day say, he said, man, I love this church. They have a 9 o'clock service. I can go get it over with, and I got the rest of the day free. Now, boy, he really sounded like he got a burden. That's a real burden for church and sinner in the Lord. And I don't care if you go to church at 9 o'clock. Have it at 8, have it at 7. I don't care. I don't care what time you have. Church. But our, our, jo- our, 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 our mentality is let's go worship God for a minute and get it over with and feel good the next week. Don't y'all buck up on me this morning now. Listen, there was a time when people loved to come to church. There was a time when people enjoyed coming. Now you're so full of the pleasures of this world you ain't got no hunger for God no more. You know what that means? We need it more than we thought we, thought we did. I'm a fanatic. I believe you ought to go to church, brother. When my company comes, I've got company right now. That whole row right there. Uh, them girls from Florida, they know. They, nobody said, Brother Danny, are we going to church in the morning? Don't ask a dumb question like that. Sunday, ain't it? Amen? Amen. If I had company on Sunday, like some of you do, and it's so strange that I never do. None of my kin folks ever drop in on Sunday afternoon. I hear people all the time, well, well, my brother come over and we ain't seen him. Listen, my brother, I ain't got a brother. If he came over on Sunday at 5 o'clock, I said, come on, y'all go to church with us. You wouldn't. I would. You say, well, what if I can't? I say, they're blown in the refrigerator. We'll see you in a little bit. I mean that. I mean that, and I preach it, and I practice it, and you ought to, too. I'm going to say something to all you people with kids. If you had kids up here a while ago, you ought to get them kids in every single Bible preach. You ought to let them hear it on YouTube. You ought to hear it played on your radio. You ought to hear it playing in your house. Brother, we are in a fight with these kids like we've never been before. The devil's after he's coming in the back door. I'm brother like his coattails on fire. You're in a fight for your kids like you have no idea. If some of you people knew the trash some of your kids talked just this week, you'd say, oh, I would have never believed that. I take them to church on Sunday. That's a whole lot more than going to church on Sunday morning. Living a Christian life is something you do all day long. Teach them in the morning. Teach them at night. I'm a fanatic. I'm fixed on going to church. If you can't, you can't. If you're in a wheelchair in a rest home, you can't get on the radio, get on TV, get on the internet the best you can. But if God's blessed you with health, if God has blessed you with health, get your 
carcass up and get in the house of God and get in there and take your family, your, your kids, your mama, your dad. I'm, my heart is fixed on going to church. I'm a firm believer in it. I guess some of y'all think I can do this all by myself sometime, but I can't. It takes a bunch of us. And thank God we got some that'll do that. Next, I'm gonna say my heart is fixed on morality. My mind's done made up on what's right and what's wrong. I'm not saying nobody can't teach me nothing. I, I, don't, I got a lot to learn. But my heart is fixed about drugs. My heart is fixed about alcohol. Fixed. Done. That book said, look not upon the wine when it moves itself aright, when it's fermented. One old drunk come to the preacher and he said, he said, now preacher, you said not to drink wine. You know it says in the Bible we can drink wine. He said, it does not. He said, yeah, it does. You know it's in there. He said, no, it ain't in there that you can drink wine. He said, yes, it does. He said, the Bible says, and to that day, in that time, with that wine, use a little, use a little, only when you're sick, and that's for your stomach's sake, and often, like, like NyQuil, like medicine, that's the only time, it's all right, and then it's just a little, not just a drink, because you like it. He said, well, it's in there. And he said, you're just mad to make an excuse because you want to drink it. Ain't that right? Now look, I know people. I know. Don't, don't y'all sit there and buck up on me. If you think I'm going to change my mind on drinking alcohol, you're in the wrong place. It ain't, I saw what it did to my daddy. I saw what it did to my uncle. I see what it's done to thousands of people. It ain't no good, kids. It ain't no good. Do you honestly think I ought to get up here and tell these kids it's all right to drink a little bit? That's how every alcoholic in the world started out. Thank God we got a preacher in a church that said, just leave it alone, just leave it alone. Leave it alone. Same thing as premarital sex, extramarital sex. Any kind of sexual activity outside of the marriage bed, my heart is fixed. You say, well, Brother Danny, we're in love. Still wrong. You say, well, Brother Danny, it just feels right. Still wrong. Amen. Hey man, that's why a young girl, she gets out, a boy says, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. If you love me, you would. If the if lying devil ever says that to you, you just take your two fingers like this, punch them in the eyes and say, if you love me, you wouldn't. Bing. Say amen right there. If he loved you and respected you, he'd leave you alone till you're married. And if you ain't married, you ain't got no business. You ain't got no business acting like married people. We have a lot of people wanting all the privileges of marriage, but none of the responsibilities of marriage. There's some responsibilities come with marriage. You can't just run out here and shack up and whore all over town and, and hop all over to, from one football player to the other and expect everything to go right in your life. It ain't going to happen. I'm telling you, brother, I'm fixed on morality. There's two types of girls in here this morning. You that have messed up and you that ain't. You that have messed up, make up your mind this morning, no more. No more until I'm married. You say, well, I'm getting married. Okay. It, it ain't gonna kill you then, is it? No more till I'm married. And the other type of girl is, I've already messed up. Preacher, pray for me that I'm not gonna do it till I'm married. The other kind of girl says, I've never been involved in that, and I'm going to keep myself clear, clean for my husband. Same, two types of boys in here. Sometimes the girls get all the preaching, and the wicked, low-down boys get off scot-free. It takes two tango. You know that, right? If there's a girl that's messed up, there's a boy that's messed up, usually. And I'm telling you this morning, there's two types of boys in here. You that have messed up, and you that ain't. If you have messed up, get in the altar this morning like you got good sense, and say, God, no more sexual stuff. No more until I'm married. One lady said, that's not practical. You're telling God, just go tell him you thought he ain't practical. Tell God he's, that show, you know what that is? It shows you how out of touch our generation has got with the word of God. It ain't gonna kill you. Amen? You say, well, I can't wait. Get married. Better to marry than to burn. I can't get married. Wait. That's your choice. 
Lord have mercy, boy. I'm, you're loving this, ain't you? Some, hey, I'm telling you, my heart is fixed. Don't you come in there and try to tell me. But Brother Danny, in our situation, one lady said, she told me, she said, I want to get married. But she said, if we marry, if we get married, we lose all of our benefits. He gets a lot from the government, gets a lot from the government. And I said, well, there's two things here. That's the government paying you to shack up. The government will pay the girls to shack up and have babies, and then the government or us. The government ain't got no money except what it takes from me and you. That's where they get their money, us. And they'll pay you to shack up and have babies not married. As soon as you get married, all that gets cut out, and you're penalized for doing right. That's the, the devil in control of the world. She said, Brother Danny, me and him's going to sneak off to Mexico, and we're going to get married down there in Mexico. Then it'll be right inside of God, and then we're going to come back here, and that way he won't lose his benefits. What do you think about that? And I said, to be honest with you, it sounds crooked. She said, well, I don't see why. We're really married in the sight of God. I said, but what you're telling the government, you're lying to the government. I know they're crooks and they can't tell the truth, but that don't give us right to lie to them. I said, you're lying to the government. What you're saying is, we're really married, God, but no, we're not government. I said, Lord, ain't gonna bless no mess like that. You try to cheat people like that, you never will get nowhere. Just man up and be honest. If you're gonna get married, get married, lose your benefits, and sell that nice car and have a cheap car. Or no car. I'd rather be right, not have a car. Amen, I mean that. Listen, sin is still poison. You will still pay for sin. You will still pay for sin. Drugs will take you down a road you never thought you'd go down. And I'm going to say this, and I'm through. I get off on all kinds of stuff this morning. I'm going to say this, and I'm about done. Don't ever think that you can just go this far in sin and stop. Don't ever think that. Sin always leads to another sin. First thing you know, you'll be saying cuss words. Next thing you know, you'll be drinking a little bit. Next thing you know, you'll be watching movies that you would never have watched before that and no amount of money could make you. Next thing you know, listen, these guys are perverts, y'all girls. They're all, it's on inside of it, and some of the girls are too. What he wants now, it's going to get worse later on. Without, I'm wearing a mixed crowd. That's as plain as I'm going to get. But you don't ever, sin don't ever satisfy. You want more, different. Try this, try that, try this, try that. And that's how these people wind up in these rehabs. That's why they wind up in a crack house. There's people here this morning that used to sit in these seats just like y'all are sitting. And they're out there right now in jail, right now in jail. You know why? They thought they could just play with sin and it ain't gonna hurt you. It will hurt you. It will hurt you. I'm here to tell you this morning, my heart's fixed. I ain't perfect, and I sure don't always live up to everything I'm supposed to. I, I believe in living perfect. I don't, but I believe in it. Somebody said, you ought to practice what you preach. If that's all you pr practice, you ain't preaching much. It's impossible to practice everything I preach. I try, though. That's my goal. My goal is to live sinless. That's my goal, brother. Not how close we can get to the edge. Sinless. My heart is fixed. Let me ask you a question this morning. Y'all come on. I want to hear that song again. Could we do that? Man, that'd be a blessing. Let's stand with our heads bowed. I've not always been faithful, but he has. I've not always said the right things, but he has. Maybe you're here this morning. You say, Brother Danny, that hit me right square between the eyes, and I need to make a move for God this morning. Young person, teenager, don't you dare be embarrassed. Don't you be embarrassed. Don't you be ashamed from this altar. While they sing this first verse of this song, let's fill this altar up here this morning. You say, Brother Danny, I need to, you know what? I need to just get in that altar and say, I sure ain't been everything I have been, but he has. And I'm gonna start out anew and afresh today. Start all over. Let's sing. Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name. Do it, Lord, right now. I've not always been faithful, but He has. I've not always been great. 
Hey, man, come on, come on. Come on, just get out of your seat and come right now. Come on, young lady, young man, come on right now. Let's obey God. Let's obey the Lord right now. Hallelujah. Yep, yep. Come on, come on now, come on now, come on. I come tell on, him I'm not strong, but he oh, says yeah. I am. That's right, thank God. And I say I can't go yeah, on, but he says I can. He'll help you this morning, says says yeah. Come on, mamas and daddies. Come on, husbands and wives. Come on, everyone. teenagers, let's go, let's go, let's go. You know, you're not going to hell, man. You don't. If we're never happy. That's all right. It's worth it. If you're never happy, the main thing in life ain't being happy. It's being holy. God's holiness is above His uh, His desire for you to be happy. Because the main thing is God wants you happy. That's the biggest bunch of bull I've heard in a long time. The main thing is God wants you right. If you get to be happy, that's an added benefit. Well. Uh, we're going to go now. I'll call somebody to work on the air conditioning, y'all. It's, it's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but I mean, you'll live. I don't reckon you'll die. But um, it's good for you to sweat. Good for you. So let's, let's all uh, 
be back this evening at 5.30. We'll leave them running full blast. So it'll be cool in here tonight. 5.30, 6 o'clock church start. We'll have some maybe some camp testimonies tonight and we'll make plans for our Virginia trip. If you've not got signed up, sign up. Kids, you can...